Okay. Just so for those of you that are keeping track of me, I've started the recording. And let me give another little post here. So for those of you that want the continuing education credits, there's a link to continuing education credits. You can do that at your leisure. Do it today, though, because I do a, a date sort. And then that way I keep track of who was, who was here and who wasn't. So, well, I'm going to go ahead and introduce, let me introduce myself. My name is Peter Smollett. I'm the New York State Extension Forester. I uh, coordinate the Forest Connect uh, program, the Forestry Extension program in New York, focusing on private woodlands and the sustainability of private woodlands. One of the big issues that we have in New York is making sure that we have healthy, sustainable forest ecosystems for a variety of outputs and amenities. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Baron Bossi, who's a colleague here in the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell, and who's been doing work on several of the issues that are stressing our ecosystems, and he's agreed to give a presentation. So with this, Baron, I'm going to turn the airwaves over to you. I'm going to mute my microphone and just sit here and enjoy the presentation. So Baron, welcome. Thank you, Pete. I see there's a couple of people that don't have sound, and I know you will address that with them directly. Uh, unless I see a wave of people saying they can't hear me, I will assume everybody is able to listen to what I have to say. Um, so welcome to everybody. I think uh, there's a nice spread from the little uh, scroll menu that I saw as far west as Nebraska and obviously up to Maine and into Canada. Uh, we're missing the southeast here, but uh, I've centered my presentation on to process the species in the northeast, but they are also applicable to um, places in the southeast and way beyond the Midwest uh, and so forth. But obviously, we're dealing with forest ecosystems here. So uh, I entitled this uh, slide or the intro that I will be addressing our neighborhood, in particular, how some species of uh, organisms that we care about more or less or do not care about in our neighborhoods, how they are changing um, the way that we experience our neighborhoods <clears throat> and the benefits and pleasures we derive from them. So what I wanted to start with, though, is to <clears throat> just give an introduction that changes in the woods or in the landscapes have always been part of continents of ecosystems, um, whether that's human-induced or otherwise. So change has always been there and it, it, it will always be there. It's the way that we interpret that. Uh, that may change the way that we see uh, benefits or detriments. Agricultural landscapes like the one that I showed you, that's how the Finger Lakes would have probably looked like uh, 120 years ago with very few woodlands, largely dairy farming. Uh, it's a very different scene today. Those of you that have been here will see that 60 uh, to 70 percent of the landscape is now forested. And this landscape returned into tree cover in the absence of deer, which is something that we will be talking about <clears throat> in a moment. Uh, humans have shaped the way that we experience our landscape, faunal and uh, floral assemblages, uh, forever. Here's just a very crass example of the colonization of the North American landscapes. I don't know whether you would feel more comfortable in a landscape like that with big mega herbivores that can deliver a lot of food, but may also be scary like the, uh, like the predators on the left. But clearly we had an impact together with climate change um, <clears throat> on, the, uh, on the faunal and floral composition of where, where we live. Um, that may not always be as drastic, but uh, the landscapes of the Finger Lakes, where I'm sitting here today looking out onto the Cornell um, football field, uh, at some point look a little bit like this, with uh, African lions, the same species, roaming, roaming the areas and, uh, uh, and big charismatic uh, animals with trunks pushing over trees. We do not see that anymore, uh, but this is just uh, 12, 13,000 years ago. So we need to keep that in mind as we're trying to assess how the forests and, uh, uh, and landscapes around are changing. Some more recent extinctions that are irreversible, even though there are some uh, 
some people that are playing around with the idea to um, re-invoke or repopulate the North American continent with passenger pigeons using genetic techniques. Um, the Carolina parakeet and the passenger pigeon, some very, very abundant species, uh, have been lost just in the last 120 years or so. Um, and we have some what I call functional extinction as well. These species are also with us, whether it's the American chestnut, uh, the wolf, or the eastern mountain lion, or cougar. Uh, in essence, they don't play a role in our forest ecosystems anymore because of the low abundance or complete absence in terms of the wolf and the, and the cougar. Obviously, there are efforts to bring the American chestnut back. Um, but uh, right now, the, the abundance of the American chestnut really doesn't play a role for our forest ecosystems at this point. And then we get to a map like this. Uh, this is centered on New York. By the Nature Conservancy, it's just a couple of years old, um, where they look at the tree regeneration in New York. And uh, you can see that. The areas in red show very poor tree regeneration. The areas in green uh, are much better. Um, and uh, there are places where we do not have uh, forest in the extent uh, that's just the, the old uh, lake plains that are in white right now. So we can see that in lots of places like the Adirondacks, supposedly there is tree regeneration. Uh, but that's just some of the uh, some of the forest trees, it doesn't concern the understory species or others. So this is just probably a best case scenario. But something is clearly wrong in, uh, in southern New York where we would fail to regenerate the woods if things continue the way that they are right now. And then we have graphs like this. This is compiled from state harvest records that go a long ways in New York. It's probably the best record that we have. This is just deer harvest statistics. The map that I showed you before about tree regeneration was in response to perceived threats by deer overabundance uh, on forest regeneration. So that was clearly the message in that report. We have too many deer on the landscape to allow recovery of the woods uh, in New York State. Well, that's not a problem that's restricted uh, to New York, you can see that in the in the states surrounding us, um, we have a seemingly ever increasing deer harvest. This is not necessarily a reflection of the deer abundance, because we have reports from Pennsylvania and New Jersey and other places that deer numbers went through the roof in the 50s and 60s with mass mortality over winters. Um, where uh, some people report out of riparian areas every hundred yards was a dead deer, and uh, people pull them out of the woods in the in the spring. Um, so this is more a reflection of the management agencies trying to combat the high deer abundance by legalizing antlerless harvest and liberating them the number of permits that they're giving, um, and it seems to be ever increasing. And that's something that's not just true for the East Coast but it also goes throughout the uh, entire Midwest and further out west. Uh, I had a student compile all of the graph, always looked the same. But the forests are also experiencing what we call other stressors. The typical worm associations that you may have in mind is that of beneficial species for gardens, uh, fishing experiences, um, and uh, nightcrawler purchases, as you can see in the picture on the left. But that's uh, not necessarily true for much of the East Coast um, because the worms are all introduced in this area. We have to go as far south as Georgia and South Carolina to find native earthworms. There are a number of ideas why we do not have native earthworms. Some people think it was associated with, uh, with the glaciation that we're pushing out the earthworms. <clears throat> there was no soil left uh, where ice was grinding down uh, to the uh, to the bedrock, but the earthworms that were in existence and were documented were in fact much further south than the area of the last glaciation. So why do we worry about the earthworms? So just to reiterate, all earthworms on the east coast north of Massachusetts 
I'm sorry, north of Maryland are introduced. We do not have native earthworms in these areas. Um, what happens in the forest, usually without the presence of earthworms, is that we have a very well-developed uh, humus layer, as you can see here on the, on the left side of the picture. Uh, a lot of the tree root, a lot of the herbaceous understory, a lot of the tree seedlings that would regenerate would actually root in this humus layer. And you can see it's a very well-developed stratification of the different layers. Once we have earthworms come in, you get an erosion effect. The humus layer that is very thick and has high moisture holding capacity completely disappears. Um, and we get annual leaf litter inputs in the way that you see it on this picture here, where shortly before a leaf fall in the fall, uh, you see a lot of exposed bare ground, almost like in, a, in, a, in an agricultural field. So this is not something that the organisms that live in the leaf litter layer, um, whether these are plants or whether these are animals, are adapted to. Um, the effect that earthworms usually have and they're associated with is one of aeration of the soil, which is in fact not true. And that may be true for agricultural landscape where heavy machinery may compact the soil. Uh, in forested uh, areas where the decomposition goes through fungal food webs, earthworms actually compact the soil. And where we have slopes, we get an erosion effect. Usually soils like this on the left side here would be able to hold all the moisture that falls on it, uh, while soils that are infested by earthworms and where the humus layer has disappeared, we get a lot of runoff from the hills that then ends up in our streams. Uh, and that increases nutrient loading. And you get exposed bedrock as well. That shouldn't be happening after 10,000 years of decomposition uh, and soil building processes. So earthworms are not the benef beneficial organisms that they're made to be in a lot of places. We discovered the effect of earthworms when we initially started to look at effects of invasive plants on forest ecosystems. Um, I started my career by doing biological control of purple loose drive and then branched out to some other wetland plants and then forest uh, plants. And we found effects of these introduced plants on aquatic organisms, and we then branched out together with a couple of collaborators, John Merritt, Vicky Nuzo, um, and, and others, and tried to understand what plant invasions would actually create in forest ecosystems. I don't have time to really go into the details, but uh, you can request uh, papers from me. They were published in Conservation Biology in 2009. Uh, and we basically asked what are three main invaders here, uh, garlic mustard, uh, microstegium, Japanese stilt grass, or barberry, a shrub, would have an effect on uh, salamanders, particularly red back salamanders, one of the most common organisms in, in eastern woodlands. Uh, we were anticipating large effects. We used 15 different forests in New York and Pennsylvania to assess their effects, and what we uh, in fact discovered was that the earthworms are the ecosystem engineers. The effects that we thought would be associated with invasive plants, uh, we could not find. And instead, we found the effects of earthworms. And we get a cascading effects of earthworms on forest ecosystem, particularly on the forest floor. Earthworms will eat the leaf litter layer, so we lose the leaf litter layer. With the loss of the leaf litter layer, it's not only plant growth that may be affected, as I explained earlier, we're also losing a lot of the invertebrates that would live in the leaf litter layer. And following that, we get a crash of the salamander populations. While adult females like this one here would be able to use earthworms as food, uh, the juveniles that are being born, these redback salamanders don't need to migrate for ponds anymore. They're entirely terrestrial with a female guarding eggs for several months in a small hole uh, under a log or in a, in a tree stump. Uh, once the small ones emerge uh, in August and September, they can only eat small invertebrates that fit into their mouth. Um, and that would be a lot of little spiders and other things that would leave, uh, live in the leaf litter layer. So we get a crash in terms of the recruitment of the salamanders as earthworms are invading. The females continue to lay large clutches, um, but there is no survival of the juvenile. So 
the only effect that we could find here was that invasive plants actually accelerate the leaf blow off, uh, but they do not drive the forest deterioration. So a situation like this here on the left side where we have a beautiful trillium meadow, that's actually Fillmore Glen State Park here in upstate New York, it looks like this forest system uh, is reasonably healthy with the expanse of trilliums, but the, uh, the well-trained eye can see that we're missing a shrub layer here. Uh, there's a deer effect there. There are earthworms all over the place. This may be still okay for trilliums and they can survive there, but it's a salamander. Uh, desert, very, very few that are able to survive under those conditions. So we discovered earthworms as we were trying to look at plant uh, invasion. Uh, what we, we also found is that what people always think about the introduced plants, whether this was uh, garlic mustard, mycostegium, or barberry, is that the drivers of a forest deterioration, uh, we could not detect. Instead, it was earthworms first, and only where we had the earthworms present could we find our uh, invasive plants. Now, I need to restrict that to the three plants that we actually work with uh, and not to the other ones. But uh, here's another shot from Fillmore Glen. I don't know what the coexistence of these plants that are usually interpreted as being threatened by garlic mustard are happy in their coexistence, but at least they uh, grow uh, together. And this is for extended periods of time. We tried at the time, and there, there are still some uh, approaches of trying to develop a biological control for garlic mustard. Um, the question about leaf litter loss acceleration that I just see here, uh, I cannot explain. Uh, there's just the correlation. Um, the litter that introduced plants may produce may be less well defended compared to oak litter. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> that, may, that may need some additional uh, research to, uh, to understand that. They may be cheaper to produce and maybe less well defended. So uh, to go back to garlic mustard, uh, as we're trying to develop biological control, we did some long-term monitoring. So what we find uh, over time is that garlic mustard, in fact, disappears even without control methods. So there may be many of you that um, try to control garlic mustard in your forest environment. Um, I can uh, tell you that these are data from New Jersey all the way to Illinois from 15 different woods um, where this was done in permanent quadrats. So we go back to the same location over and over again. Um, and these plants disappear if you don't do anything. We now know from some experiments that this is due to negative soil feedback where garlic mustard builds up uh, microbial communities that are to the detriment of garlic mustard, but all other plants can still tolerate them. This effect will not happen if you continue to control garlic mustard, whether that's with spray or with, it, or with pulling. So if you leave it alone, it will disappear. This is just for garlic mustard, not for, for other plants. But uh, those of you that want to see garlic mustard disappear out of the woods, they should relax and just uh, lean back and do something different. Um, in the end, we will come back uh, and see the importance of deer. Here is an example from Illinois from Fermilab, how deer and introduced plants actually interact. This is uh, work from Victoria Nuzu, who has done this as a botanist trying to help Fermilab manage their woodlands, which had seen a great deterioration and an increase in deer abundance. And in 1990, uh, 1998, uh, they executed a deer call where they took 90% of the deer herd out of Fermilab. At that time, garlic mustard, the black bars here, was just starting to invade the woods in, at Fermilab. It was continued to have a reasonably high abundance, but what you can see, these are the yellow portions of the columns. Uh, the native vegetation returned and was very abundant after the deer, uh, the deer call. They need to continue to reduce deer abundance, but uh, native plants, despite this increase in garlic mustard abundance, definitely weren't threatened by garlic mustard. So garlic mustard doesn't seem to have an effect on the recovery of the plants, but deer effect will have.
in terms of the question how old the populations are where this uh, this effect was seen, we do not know how old the populations are. We used the most abundant fans to actually establish our initial quadrats where garlic mustard had been in the area for many years. But we do not have the monitoring of the initial uh, colonization of these plots. We know that in the, along the east coast, within five years, you should see a decline of garlic mustard in the places where it freshly colonized. This may be different out in the Midwest. And I'm staying close to the mic. My mic does not move from my mouth, by the way. So in the end, when we think about plants and what they experience, they experience a whole bunch of things all simultaneously. Uh, they experience the introduction of, uh, of plants like garlic mustard, they experience the introduction of worms, of other invertebrates like slugs, but they also experience an increase in the deer abundance over time. And this is just a hypothetical example that may drive certain plant species that are being eaten by the deer uh, down below something that's, that could be termed a threatened and endangered species threshold. That deer have an effect very often can be demonstrated by exposures, but I will talk about some caveats there as well. When we see, this is again a picture from Fermilab where we see an abundant vegetation on the inside, but not on the outside. So that seems to be clearly associated uh, with excluding deer. But putting fences up has all kinds of other effects as well. But uh, what people have really tried to do is put the various stressors, that's what we call plants or slugs or uh, <clears throat> introduced earthworms in the context of a unified framework where we study them all simultaneously. And that's not an easy thing to do um, because it's expensive and it's uh, time demanding, um, but it's something that needs to be done and we have tried to accomplish that over time. We'll talk a little bit more about the effects of deer that we see uh, in forest ecosystem. Here is a study from New Jersey where people looked at bird species and their abundance. And they grouped bird species into species that forage and nest in the canopy or in the mid-story or at, uh, at the ground and, and shrub level. And what you can see is, and this is interpreted as a, as a deer effect, that particularly the species that live in the mid-story and forage in the mid-story and nest and feed on the ground have declined while the species <clears throat> that uh, live and feed in the canopy have held their own over time. Then the best experiment that we have seen in terms of uh, the effect of deer on uh, forest ecosystems uh, is the Allegheny deer experiment. And that was done after a clear cut uh, in the Allegheny National Forest where large exclosures were created and that experiment ran from 1979 to 1990 where different densities of deer were fenced on the inside. So we didn't have an exclosure, but an enclosure experiment. The problem with exclosures is that we completely eliminate deer of the landscape where they are obviously exclosed. Um, but we, we do not necessarily want to reduce deer abundance to zero. That would not be realistic and desirable. But it's very difficult to maintain deer abundance at desired level, particularly at higher levels here by 20 to 30 per square kilometer. They always try to get out because the conditions on the inside are not very good. Uh, so they abandoned uh, this experiment in the 1990s, but we're still getting some, uh, some data out of these experiments. So what's depicted here is really the tree species diversity as a function of deer abundance. And what you can see early on is as deer abundance increases, the number of trees that are able to main, uh, be maintained in these areas declines. The, uh, the diversity is not particularly great, but nevertheless, we see this decline. This then has trickle up effect through the entire food web associated with the tree species diversity and here depicted as a function of deer density per square kilometer. Um, is that the caterpillar density uh, goes down uh, as deer numbers are increasing. Um, and this is particularly important for birds because all birds feed their young uh, with, uh, with insects. And so again here we see that the bird density, this is measured in 2008, 
remember that the ex experiment uh, ended in 1990. So we have this legacy effect of the deer uh, experiment that was done from 1979 to 1990 linger in these forests. Uh, the higher the deer were for the 10 year time frame, the fewer birds we actually have uh, in these experimental plots. By now the fences are long gone, so that experiment is not detained, but we have the legacy effect uh, that we can still measure. So again, the effect of deer trickles up to the food webs and affects all kinds of organisms, not just the ones that are directly eating, but also then the ones that would live or the ones that should have been eaten or would have been eaten. So, and then we all have seen probably pictures like this, the effect of long-term deer browse. Uh, and it can result into something like a fern understory that is completely dominant and excluding almost everything, or something like this on the on the right side, where we basically have nothing growing on the forest floor, while we have a very well established and interesting looking overstory. This is largely oaks here, and it's uh, in the western slope on uh, Cayuga Lake in the village of Lansing. The problem that I see in areas like this is what we are not experienced. We have a depauperate landscape and while we may appreciate the canopy effect and the park-like effect of a landscape like this, uh, many, many, many organisms that should be living in these uh, forests cannot make a living anymore. Um, about the question of the outlier, uh, I can send you the paper if you like it. It's actually a, a, a free, uh, it's it's uh, it's available without a subscription. Um, it's by Nuttall. I do not remember what the outlier were about the uh, uh, um, about the caterpillars. We can go back to that, and right? we can revisit that. So again, here we have a depauperate experience, not the rich, diverse uh, fauna and flora that we would experience in places with lower deer abundance. And we create something that's shifting baselines. When I came to the Finger Lakes in 1992, I looked around and said, oh, this is what the Finger Lakes were looking like. Well, not quite true. It was what the Finger Lakes and the forests were looking like in 1992. Um, sometimes we have records. Sometimes we only have pictures. Sometimes we only have stories of how things looked like before and after. This is in Northern Illinois, where uh, something, a trillium carpet on the forest floor was reduced to a very little, um, there are still some trilliums there, um, but definitely not the showy display that was there before. Um, the question in situations like this is, is it all just deer or is it something more? Uh, and we can't do that, or we can't answer that question with any sophistication unless we have uh, done some research. So my program here at Cornell um, had two main foci. One was to understand whether there are fundamental differences between introduced and native plants. And I'm not gonna address that today. Uh, but the other part is the topic of this presentation. It's the importance of single and multiple stressors. And we're looking at plants and deer and earthworms and invertebrates and some other stressors. And for us, the important thing is we want to understand who the drivers are and who tags along. If deer are stressing forest understories and introduced plants basically don't do anything, weeding, spraying, or managing invasive plants may not do anything for conservation purposes. Uh, if earthworms are the drivers of forest deterioration and attacking plants or deer uh, wouldn't make any sense either. Uh, so we need to understand who the important stressors are, and then we can target them with management efforts if so desired. Um, what we have done to do this uh, is, with the last almost 10 years is create an exclosure network. I talked about the detriments of exclosures uh, by not having any deer on the inside, but that's all that we could uh, actually accomplish. Uh, there are four um, experiment or approaches that I'm outlining here. And I have uh, ex an exclosure network in the area around and on West Point that's funded by the Department of Defense. And these are 12, 12 different exclosures at uh, various sites. They're always paired, meaning that we have a fence plot and an open plot. They are 30 by 30 meters each. 
Then we have three different exclosure networks here in the area surround, surrounding Cornell. Uh, one is actually my own experimental farm it's called Bobbling Hill, where we experiment with all kinds of things uh, of exclusions of various sizes, and I'm going to go into that one in a moment. One of my graduate student, uh, students, N.S. Dobson, is looking at the interactions of deer and worms in particular, um, and we have ten or uh, five sites, ten paired locations, and the area of the exclusions are 50 by 50 meters, while the ones at West Point were 30 by 30 meters. Uh, the 30 by 30 meters we realized uh, is limiting of what we can say. It's a little too small, um, but we are already on the big side. A lot of the exclusions are much, much smaller in the order of 10 by 10 meters, but there's lots of edge effects. We can't capture what is really happening once we have exclosures so that are that small. Uh, most recently, um, I've been um, awarded money from the Atkinson Center of the Sustainable Future here at Cornell to create larger scale exclosures. And these are five paired uh, sites. There are two hectares each or five acres, um, each one with a fence plot and an open control plot that adjacent to that. So the exclosure purposes vary a little bit. Uh, the ones at West Point, as I said, was uh, multiple stressors, and we were looking at earthworm slugs, deer, invasive plants, and some invasive insects, um, and the funding agencies were, were asserted. The deer worm ones, as I said, 50 by 50 meters, we are in five forests here. As most people are not from the area, I will not go into the details. Some of you may know those places, um, but we have areas with and without worm invasions in the same in the same forest, and we established exclosures where there are earthworms and where there are no earthworms. So that allows a factorial design to really tease apart the deal or the worm attack. The Atkinson Center plots, again, are by forest. We belong to Cornell. One belongs to the Finger Lakes Land Trust, and the other one is on our, uh, uh, on our own farm. How do we get no earthworms? That just means that the earthworms never got to that. Um, so there are places in the Northeast that do not have earthworm invasions yet. Um, that's how we get earthworms. We needed, uh, Annis was running throughout the county during her first year trying to find these forests that had both invasion fronts of earthworms and places where there were no uh, uh, earthworm invasions. And she was lucky enough to find some of those. Uh, the last one is, as I said, our own experimental farm or woodland. Uh, where we have largely tried to protect unique and rare plants, whether these are pink lady slippers, trilliums, or ginseng, by, by fencing them, individually marking uh, plants that are inside or outside of these exclosures and trying to understand uh, how they're growing, what their reproductive uh, output is, and what their survival rates are. And that's obviously ongoing. They all look somewhat like this. Um, you have a plastic fence with an, with an entry somewhere. Initially, when we erect these fences, we, uh, we mark them with flags so the deer learn uh, to see that there is an obstacle. The plastic fencing uh, is allowing easy maintenance because you can just use scissors or others uh, if the tree falls, and there's always a tree falling somewhere in the woods uh, to repair the fences. The picture that you see here is actually a self-standing fence right now. We actually use uh, cables and, uh, and attach these cables to our existing trees, so that reduces the expense even further. Um, so if some of you are interested in how to do that, I can talk about that uh, to you individually or answer, answer questions via email. Uh, but in essence, the picture in the woods looks like this. We have an inside and an, and an outside. Uh, and we have individual plants that are marked with metal tags so we know the individual and re we revisit these individuals, we measure them, we look at whether they're flowering, whether they're uh, producing seeds and so forth, uh, whether they're being eaten or not. And that goes on for, for many years. Here's an effect uh, that's just fresh out of uh, Anna Dobson's work. Um, and I know this is a busy slide, but these are 15 different plant species. These are all herbaceous, if I'm not mistaken. We have a total of 20 that she actually looked at. Um, and this is the response to earthworm density. So we extract earthworms using mustard solution 
and then we count them. And the ones where you see a red line in here, this is actually statistically significant. So what you can see by just looking across this, these are just seedlings that are maybe a year or two old that we planted out. Um, the effect of earthworms, when it is significant, um, is always negative, and it's for all the plant species. There are some plant species that don't seem to be affected, like this one, or uh, colophyllum, I believe, is this one. Uh, they don't seem to be caring about the earthworms, at least at this stage in their life, they don't. But there's not a single positive effect, even though we have some grasses in there that the earthworms have, on the growth of seedlings. Um, so the effect of the earthworms is negative, and what we're depicting here is survival. Uh, are all earthworms invasive? Well, uh, that depends a little bit on what, what you consider invasive. Um, and I'm not quite sure where you are, uh, Derek. There are native earthworms south of, uh, uh, of Maryland or in the, in the Carolinas. There are native earthworms in the prairies. There are native earthworms on the west coast. So in Philadelphia, all the earthworms are introduced and all of them are expanded. So if that is uh, uh, invasive for you, all earthworms in your area are introduced and invasive. The effect of the earthworms, there are different builds. Some live on the surface, some are shallow burrows, and some are deep burrows like the night crawler. Um, the effect of these different earthworm species are different. So we're working on that, trying to tease that apart. <clears throat> the earthworms come both from Europe and from Asia. So that's as far as I want to go with the earthworms. Uh, we know that seedlings are negatively affected by them. Um, we're going to go into uh, the effect of fencing. And you will see here that I call it not a deer effect, but a fencing effect. Because fencing does more than just exclude deer. <coughs> Excuse me. It prevents other organisms from accessing that. We see some effects on, on communities that were unanticipated. But uh, that's why you see this uh, being called a fencing effect. What we were anticipating, these are data from West Point, is that as we are fencing certain areas, that the vegetation will respond positively to the fencing effect and will become more diverse um, and increase in, in height. What you're actually seeing here is that open is an area that accessible by deer and fenced obviously is the area where deer are excluded. We do not see an effect over the years since establishment, so this is four years on the species. Richmond is uh, inside and outside, the vegetation cover, the litter volume, or the vegetation height. There are some differences between years, which are largely driven by, uh, by climate differences. I'm not entirely sure why 2008 is so low in terms of the vegetation height. But in essence, what we can say is our vegetation community using permanent quadrats that are a meter square in size uh, does not show any recovery. And we were very, very surprised because in some other places, we have seen rapid recovery of forest communities. Um, and here, the effect that we'd be seeing or the no effect that we're seeing here is a fact that at West Point, deer abundance has been high, um, very, very high for many, many decades. So in essence, the deer have sorted the vegetation out into organisms that can tolerate deer herbivory. There may even be some evolutionary changes in among the plant species um, that um, we're seeing here. We're following that one up. So we may see some dwarfing. Um, the plants just do not become taller, even if uh, deer herbivory does not exist anymore. But it's all a has also associated with the way that we typically assess vegetation, and that's in permanent quadrats. What we have seen in these places is that individual plants responded positively to the cessation of deer herbivory, and they became taller, started to flower. But we didn't capture that in our quadrat. So, but it's something to be really aware of if you say. To show a deer effect, I'm just going to put a fence around an area, and then we will see that if the vegetation recovers quickly on the inside, may not necessarily borne out. Um, and so we are contemplating different ways of actually capturing that, much more so by looking at marked individuals instead of an entire community. 
also if the entire area has been negatively affected um, by by deer herbivory or, or any other change, there may not be enough organisms in the area that uh, can actually produce fruit or seed that can be delivered to uh, to these communities or to, to these forests. We may have to do some active restoration in these places as well. Uh, one effect that we saw, though, um, which was a little surprising but not unanticipated because other people had found the same thing, is as you go along over time, that the proportion of the invaders in the community was actually declining. Again, here, the filled squares are the ones that are growing on the inside of the fence. <clears throat> the open circles are on the outside where deer have access. So here for Microstegium Japanese stiltgrass, over time, the proportion of Japanese stiltgrass uh, on the cover of the community goes down. And we didn't do any other manipulation other than putting up a fence. So this is a deer browse effect very clearly. It stays about the same uh, on the outside. For barberry, a shrub, we see this effect starting to become significant here. So over time, you can kind of see this funnel shape that we see. There's a, the, the difference between inside and outside is increasing. We see that here for barberry as well. We actually looked at growth rates of barberry by taking uh, uh, sections out of barberry and we're looking at annual growth rates. And the annual growth rate of barberry declines on the inside compared to the outside. For garlic mustard, we see this typical decline that I earlier talked about. And there's very little variation, although uh, the decline is more pronounced on the inside uh, where deer don't have access to them. But here, it's, uh, it's a very nice effect if you want to manage invasive plants. If you reduce deer abundance, most, abundance, most likely you will also reduce the abundance of plant invaders. And the effect uh, that we're seeing is a shift in, in, uh, in the communities that the native plant species that are, usually eaten, that are usually eaten by deer become more competitive and are able to deal with the invaders and suppress some of the invaders. So that's, that's what we're seeing here. Uh, question of invasive earthworm introduction. Uh, it is not tied to vermicomposting. Those species that you have in compost are, are not the ones that are invasive in the forest. The introduction of earthworms happened through European eyes that looked at forest soils and the soils and agricultural environments and said there's no worms here, so there has to be poor soil. It was a European attitude. So initially, the earthworms were brought in to better the soils. Um, and now they're largely being dis distributed um, through uh, their use as bait and then accidentally um, for um, uh, in potted plants. So if you want to prevent introduction of earthworms to your area, forestry operation, anything that uh, moves large amounts of biomass, mulch piles, anything else, uh, don't bring it in from the outside. Uh, a lot of container plants, whether these are trees, fruit trees, or ornamental plants, will have earthworms in them because they're grown in places where earthworms are extremely abundant. It's very, very difficult to prevent the introduction of earthworms. I only bring in bare root trees if I uh, do anything in my orchard, uh, and I use bare root plants for planting or go through seeds. Uh, okay, back to our experiments here um, at West Point. Um, the question about contamination of earthworms with vermicomposting worms, that may very well be the case. Uh, um, we have seen many places on the web that sell earthworms and they say it's one particular species, but it's usually uh, a mixture of many of them. Most, most of these people that farm earthworms have no idea what they're actually farming. Uh, give them common names and the common names may not correspond to the scientific names, so it's a usual thing. Okay, uh, again, a little more about introduced plants um, and what their effects were. One of the aspects that we were looking at at West Point was how native, but that was actually why we got the funding uh, to work at West Point, looking at rare um, species. Here are two examples for the germination of uh, a snakeweed and a Ristolopia and a trillium, how they were affected uh, by microstegium invasion. And what you can actually see here 
is that both on Bristolopia and Trillium, this is the proportion of seeds uh, that germinated um, was higher under microstegium. So microstegium did not prevent the germination of it. So the negative effect was not on the on the seeds if there was a negative effect. That effect of the, the positive effect on germination actually continued in terms of the recruitment. So the recruitment of Aristolochia here was higher under microstegium, this is this line here, compared to native vegetation or under garlic mustard. Um, so if microstegium has a negative effect on native plants, it doesn't appear to be during the germination phase and it doesn't appear to be during the early seedling growth phase. We do not know where that effect may be coming from. We think the effect that a lot of people have or the, uh, uh, the assessment that microstegium drives forest deterioration is more of a deer effect. Uh, we saw that microstegium declines as deer are being excluded and the native plants are uh, recovering. You can't see my pointer. Uh, I'm sorry. I can see it. Uh, I can see it fine. Uh, I'm not sure how to fix that. So agrimonia is just another rare plant species that uh, we have, and these are the effects that I talked about. That for individual species, we actually can see this. So in the upper panel, it's just depicting the height of the plants that we marked. And these were uh, existing plants, not something we planted out. But inside the fence, the plants here are taller compared to the outside of the fence. And that effect is increasing over time. So the bottom is the years as we were assessing that. That goes for the length of the leaves as well and the number of the leaves. So here clearly over time, we see a recovery from the cessation of deer herbivory. The same effect we see for the trillium, uh, where we have them actually become bigger we see this is red trillium here. We all of a sudden find trilliums that have two stems or now even three stems, but it takes a few years for them, for them to respond positively to the exclusion of deer. So these are the experiments on West Point. Uh, now not everybody um, will have the work that we did at these 12 different sites and all uh, the data collection costs as well over a million dollars. So that's pretty much impossible for individual landowners, um, even if they're belonging to an, to an agency or, uh, or an NGO to do this assessment in, in detailed ways. Um, we have thought a lot about how we can actually transport this information or the ability to assess for yourself whether you have uh, deer abundance that's too high for the area that you care about. Uh, and typically that's being done by um, either trying to count deer using roadside surveys, uh, spotlight surveys, pellet groups, uh, some other things. All of those are entirely unreliable. All wildlife uh, people will tell you that you cannot estimate abundance by using those. Uh, the browse index that some people are promoting is depending on the species that you have in existence. If you already have a very depopulated uh, forest understory, you may may not be able to use that browse tool and deer will browse also preferentially depending on what plant species are there. So this is, uh, we do not consider this a useful tool. Uh, we try to develop something and I will show you that in a moment that gets away from counting deer because in the end what we're really concerned about is not the number of deer per area but the effect of a deer or the, the population of deer on what we care about in terms of conservation or tree regeneration. In the Adirondacks with the pauper soil, uh, 10 deer per square mile may be far too many when that may be something that can clearly be tolerated further south or in Illinois where the fertility of the soil is much higher. So again, we can't use deer abundance in those places. But we can probably measure their effect. And I uh, talked about that here by the use of sentinel plants. We can then deliberately plant these into different backgrounds. And we have done that. For example, we planted into uh, uh, our sentinels into introduced plants or areas with worm invasions or where any other things have been done. Sometimes people say, oh, the, the soil has changed too much. We have acid rain, there's land use changes and no plants can grow. 
well, you do not know until you actually try. Um, and we can do this also in areas where we manipulate the absence or presence of a stressor, whether that's a deer or introduce plants or worms. Uh, so the benefits of using a sentinel approach here is clearly that we can assess uh, whether species can occupy habitats where they have uh, that seem to have deteriorated um, or where species have disappeared. Can they still live there? Um, so we have a direct assessment of the potential impact and it's relatively easy. It's uh, very suitable for volunteer participation. And what we have done is actually we work with sentinel oaks. In this case, it's a red oak. It's one of the most widely distributed species. It's intermediate on the preference level for deer. Um, and if we believe some folks out of Pennsylvania, there hasn't been any oak recruitment in 100 years or not anything substantial. And that again was blamed on, on deer. Uh, we do grow them from seed and we can easily go and locate local genotypes if people are concerned about that. Uh, we're experimenting with other species, but I'm gonna go through the sequence here for oaks. Uh, this one was germinated uh, in a greenhouse sometimes in February, or early March. Red oaks, you can easily overwinter in the refrigerator, so you don't need to plant them as they fall off the tree. Um, you can grow them inside. It's probably like a three month old seedling. We use these small containers, two inches in diameter. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then we plant them out in the spring. Uh, we try to plant them early, and I will tell you why in a moment. We protect half from herbivory so we can assess whether these, uh, these places can actually uh, or are suitable for, for oak growth. And then we use the performance measures of survival growth and whether they are eaten or not and by what. Uh, the outcome then is, again, as I said before, can these species grow and survive in a particular environment? For example, uh, in, a, in a suburban area or uh, under a tree canopy. A lot of people will tell you, you can't regenerate oaks in a, in a closed canopy. I tell you we can, but it's very slow because there's not that much light. Um, okay, sorry, I'm gonna jump over that. It's in the wrong order. So the way that we do that, uh, we actually drill a hole here. Um, you see me doing this here. There is a picture of me uh, for those people that wanted to see. It's not the best picture, but nevertheless. Uh, so uh, we drill little holes uh, and take the uh, container. That, and those containers need to be protected from earthworm colonization, by the way. We really we grow them over a water bath with an, on elevated platforms so that earthworms can't colonize that, just to prevent earthworm introduction into places where we do not want earthworms and do not have earthworms yet. Uh, so then once we put them in, we mark them individually. Uh, half of them are caged either with, uh, with a wire mesh cage like this um, or a plastic netting. Uh, and then we come <clears throat> every, uh, every month or so. Uh, we check initially after 10 days whether we actually have oaks, the, the seedling survival or not. But even in dry years, by planting uh, seedlings out of containers, we do not get mortality at this stage. So we don't have transplant mortality. It's very, very effective that way. As I said, we are individually marking them with a the metal tag here, come back and record their survival over time. And these are things that we get. This is uh, actually out of what we call the Leopold Woods. It's just the, uh, a place here in the, in the village of Lansing, uh, right outside Ithaca. And this is the survival rate. And at the bottom is the day since planting here. So we see a uh, three month survival rate of the oaks here, the black line, if you can not see my pointer, the black dashed line is the ones that were fenced. So oaks surviving very, very well uh, in these woods, except when you expose them to deer. And within a month or, or two months, there's not a single surviving oak, uh, and this is all uh, a deer effect. Uh, so this is probably one of the more dramatic ones, but it's pretty typical in this area. So we will not regenerate oak forests in, uh, in this without doing something about deer <clears throat> or about the seedlings and protecting them. Uh, this is just another location, but a more typical example where we have mortality over time, but again, over a, a four month period, um, there's, I believe there's one oak seedling that's surviving, while uh, the protected ones, only two died. Um, we plant 20 seedlings with cages, 20 seedlings without cages is 40 seedlings per area. 
given deer foraging area to matters, we think we can assess the deer effect in an area of five to ten acres. So this is not you cannot just plant one uh, location and think I can assess uh, it for many square miles. That's not possible. But it's also the power of then having a local analysis here. How you then in the end structure your sampling if you have larger areas that you want to assess. That's something that we can we can talk about. But here's a very very powerful method of how we can look at whether uh, you have too many deer. I can clearly say now. For individual landowners, if you have more than two or three of your oak seedlings being eaten within the first year after planting, you have too many deer. Um, so that's a very clear-cut way of assessing that. Um, we have even larger impacts on, on trilliums, even when all of our oak seedlings are surviving, sometimes the trilliums are still being eaten at 30 percent, which is too much. Uh, for them to uh, maintain their populations. So we have used this to actually assess whether we can manage deer impacts on the Cornell campus and in other places. Some of you may have heard that we are uh, trying to manage deer on the Cornell campus. Um, here we can count deer and assess their abundance because they're all individually marked. So we can use camera traps to actually understand uh, what the deer abundance is. And we have something uh, that we call a core campus that's really around the area where I'm sitting right now, or the extended area. And over time, despite hunting and sterilization that is going on around campus, really the deer numbers haven't really changed in the area. Um, so if the overall deer abundance hasn't changed, did the different management schemes that we implemented change anything? And the answer, given our oak sentinel survival rate, is no. So there is a sterilization zone on campus, uh, or the outer, the, the bigger campus. Uh, there's a hunting zone, and there's a control zone where nothing happened other than the deer were darted and, uh, um, and uh, then, uh, then released again. And so in terms of the survival rate of the oaks uh, in the sterilization zone, when they were unprotected from deer or in the hunting zone unprotected or in the control zone, there is no effect. The survival rates of the oaks was almost 80% across the board. So after spending half a million dollars on trying to reduce deer impacts on the larger Cornell campus, what we can say is that it was unsuccessful, at least using, um, using the parameters that we have here. So that means we need to do something different if we want to manage oak in, uh, <clears throat> deer impacts. <clears throat> those of you, excuse me, those of you that want to do something like that, uh, this is just a quick tool of what you need. Um, and I'm going to try to get to where we need to end this presentation. So in the end, I think we can create what I call conservation landscapes. And we have to do an active role of assessment and planting to get something use, useful back, what we can do that. The first step would really be an assessment of what's driving the deterioration of the landscape. In the end, if we don't change anything, I believe, particularly in this area and many other places, the future of the, the woodlands that we have will be looking something like that. And it would be more of a shrub thicket than, any, than anything else. So uh, a lot of people will object to more aggressive deer management because they value their experiences. Whether I value these particular experiences uh, is a different question, but a lot of people that like to interact with deer um, more like pets. Um, I like to see this outside my front door. Uh, that's what I'm working to restore at. Uh, and my current thinking is that without managing deer abundance in our woods, uh, we will not be able to do anything in terms of conservation, addressing the earthworms as serious as they may be, or the plants as little impact as they may have, will not get us anywhere. So in terms of the conservation of and the land ethic, going back to Aldo, it's our individual responsibility to actually do something about the health of the land. And Aldo defined that as the capacity for the land of self-renewal. Um, that doesn't mean that it has to be static and that there is no change. But without doing anything, uh, if you do this as an ecologist, as a botanist, or a conservationist, 
is the way that we like to, at least for a while, need to see the deer flat on the ground and ready to be eaten. Thank you. That's what I had to say. And this was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, um, so just uh, as people, so there are questions that you all can write in. Baron did a great job of keeping track of those, I think, as we went along. Um, and I'm going to post a link to the uh, exit survey so people can uh, take that. And so you showed there the use, and towards the end, the use of sentinel oaks, um, like at the Leopold Woods and the Equestrian Center, you had very high survival of the protected uh, sentinel oaks. Were there earthworms in those areas? Yes. Just, yes. So like, at least for oak, the earthworms did not have an impact on planted seedlings. Would they have an impact if you had tried to establish the acorns? Do you have any research on that? We had, Anis is working on that right now. Um, so we, there, there may be a, you suffer maybe a little bit in terms of the survival, uh, but it's not dramatic. It's not as sweeping negatively as the deal would be. So if, from, if you have 20 acorns planted and uh, 19 only survive because you have earthworms, um, that's not a negative effect that will affect the population. It's really the deer that, uh, that drives the entire thing. Okay. All right. So we need the punchline here. We need to eat more venison. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there are many other different punchlines that you can, that you can have. But, well, but uh, so but it, the deer abundance across the landscape is the most important thing uh, that that we need to accomplish if we want to have forest that's diverse um, and a landscape that's diverse. Otherwise, we're not going to get there. Right. So there. Um, do, do you think, like you showed, at least on the Cornell campus? Um, and I would, uh, I think Gary Goff is on, and Christy and, and Brett, some other people that, that hunt the Arnott or are familiar with the Arnott would, would similarly see that hunting can, at least, a, so you're, you're in the central campus, hunting had no difference in uh, seedling survival compared to sterilization and compared to control. If they are not forest, uh, casual observations, I don't have the research data, but casual observations is that hunting, very aggressive hunting for the last 12 years has allowed for regeneration of plants, but that they're still pretty heavy of desirable hardwoods, but they're still a uh, pretty heavy browsing on those hardwoods. So is, is hunting I mean, hunting doesn't hurt, but is it is is that the solution that we um, that we need, or we're going to have to do other things to control the impacts of deer? So that probably depends on how high your deer population was to begin with. <clears throat> if you have an area, I compare it to uh, management of overgrazed grain land. If the cows and the sheep just uh, ruined the area for grazing, sometimes you have to take them off completely. That's maybe something we see in suburban areas where the deer numbers have to be so low that you can actually create a recovery. The R not may not have been really, really bad um, because there always has been some hunting. I, I can't tell you that. Right. Um, whether hunting will be the solution to manage deer everywhere, I doubt it. Um, but has it been assessed in a sophisticated way? No. Uh, what we do know is sterilization is not going to be the solution because the best sterilization program, I guess, in the country has happened in this area for five years, and we don't see an effect, not in terms of the population of the deer or in terms of the ecological impact. So there's really no surprise there. Um, and whether we can do it with hunting, that probably in part depends on the attitude of the hunters. Uh, if the hunters are willing to be the conservationists that they often say they are, they probably should shoot many more and not advocate for more deer in the landscape. Uh, I don't necessarily see that happening, but uh, it may take a very long time to change attitudes in the hunting population. It took a very long time uh, to make them actually shoot antlerless deer, and there are still a lot of hunters that I encounter that have a very hard time squeezing a trigger when there are no antlers on the deer. Um, so. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll let you, um, you, you'll probably have to scroll back to look through some of these questions. Um, I'll see if I can find some. Some are observations and some are questions. Yeah. There's, there's a question, 
um, about managing earthworms, but what you're saying is that that's probably not the key driver in the system. Well, it is. So earthworms do not seem to be the threat to the plants as much as uh, as the but earthworms are an incredible threat to um, like the salamander population and some of the invertebrates that need to live in the leaf litter layer. The interesting aspect that we're seeing is as the wood age, um, that earthworms seem to be declining somewhat. I'm saying that very, very slowly and tentatively because I don't feel very confident in that observation, but we're seeing older woods that recovered from early earthworm invasions. Uh, we see in places, there was a question early early on that said, uh, uh, why do we have places without earthworms? Well, earthworms didn't get everywhere. Uh, and some people in ex for experimental purposes have tried to introduce earthworms. And I think that even happened at the Arnott Forest and they were unsuccessful. So what regulates earthworm abundance at this point, we don't fully understand. Preventing them to get to the places would be the management effort that we can try to do right now. That's the most important thing. But it's it's tough and difficult because if you want to garden or if you want to mulch or you, <laughs> uh, you you're attracting earthworms big time. Um, and so these are all these are all ways that we said this uh, 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 creating better growing conditions for a lot of species. Uh, I don't think there's there's a question of eradication protocols on the horizon. There's nothing nothing there at this point. Uh, some people have experimented with acidification of the soil, but we just try to prevent uh, <coughs> acid rain from having negative impacts. Now, purposefully making the soils more acid doesn't seem to be a good management uh, situation for for earthworms. Preventing their introduction is a big thing. Um, this associate of earthworms and wetlands, I don't quite understand what that, uh, uh, what that is. Uh, earthworms like moister soils, so they're very often in riparian areas in the world. That is true. They don't like the dry uh, hilltops as much. Um, so from Jean, um, it's very clear that you don't have native earthworms in Massachusetts. Uh, that's absolutely clear, unless they were introduced with some nursery stock from South Carolina. Um, so anything that you have in Massachusetts is introduced. Okay. Let me see what I can find some. Uh, transmission of chronic wasting disease is consists of one consumes venison. Um, I would say no to that, uh, but where is that? Is that person in Wisconsin? I lost it. Pete, do you know anything about that? About, I, I guess I didn't see the question. The transmission of chronic wasting disease is a serious concern if one consumes venison. Um, it is, it's not a serious concern unless you have uh, have deer that absolutely look sick, um, and um, there you should be careful. Right. So I, um, I don't know if I saw Christy Sullivan and Gary Goff were on earlier. I'd, I'd defer to them. I know they've thought about that. Maybe some others. Uh, my sense is that there are, at least in New York, there were there was one location I recall that had chronic wasting disease and one or two deer. Um, and also, I think it did show up in Wisconsin. Um, and it's now, so in, Pencil, it's now in Pennsylvania, uh, okay. coming out of captive herd. Uh, so, um, I, I so think part, you know, part of it is that you, you should only be eating the muscle tissue right. um, and staying away from any of the spinal uh, spinal tissues. So, but I'm not. I can't. Uh, um, I, I, I'm not well versed on that, so I shouldn't really say anything at all. So here, here were some questions about some earthworm species, particularly the Anenthes ones. Uh, and I think there was a, um, um, a question from a person in Canada. Anenthes species are the worst. Anenthes are surface dwelling species that uh, uh, most of them are annual species that can be as big as small garter snakes. Um, and they have a very a weird behavior. They wiggle almost like snakes when they try to crawl away. 
They are very extremely destructive. Um, they can create casting layers that are many inches deep. Uh, there was also uh, a question about pine needle and that they live in them. Yes, absolutely, particularly mentes uh, do that. They are the worst of all the earthworm species as far as we can tell. So if you can keep them out of Canada, uh, you're doing all of the northern part of North America a favor. I'm not sure you can do that, but uh, that, that would be great. Okay, well, it looks like you've covered all the questions. There's, uh, or? there's one more question about what okay. I mean by a sentinel oak. So okay. uh, a sentinel species is any species that can give us some information about what we're wanting to assess. Here we're just using an oak seedling as a measure of how um, high deer herbivory is. We could have used a white oak or we could have used an aster or we could have used uh, any other thing, but something that we planned out and then go and take a look at. So you may have heard of canary, canary, or canary birds as sentinels in the coal mine. Again, that was just more for the dust or buildup of carbon monoxide, I believe it was. And so they had uh, canaries in, in coal mines. And here's the same thing. It's just an oak in the woods as a cannery for uh, whether uh, deer abundance is too high or not. But it can be any, any species as long as you have a good association with what it should be able to show you. Okay, well, let me let me thank Baron for a fabulous presentation. Um, Baron, you you were either uh, you were you were above 150 attendees. That may be a new record, and um, or very close to a new record. So it's a great topic and a great presentation and a, and a great message. So I, I appreciate your time and putting that together. And I thank all of the attendees. I'll be sending out a reminder on the exit survey to the e-list. So if you can't connect through the link here, uh, you'll see that link uh, within a couple of days. So you'll be able to take that exit survey, which I do hope everybody takes the exit survey. So with this, I'll call this to a close. Baird will be back at 7 p.m. tonight or probably 6.50. And um, if, if you wanted to see this twice, you're welcome to come back. and. Um, you all have a good afternoon. Thank you again, Baron. Outstanding. Thank you. And uh, those of you that are still on there, uh, if you can't find my email, is bb22 at cornell.edu. Um, I'm not sure what happens to all these questions. I'm happy to address that. Uh, there it is, typed. Um, so, and we should probably do that at the beginning, Pete, for, for the next time. Yep. So if people have questions, they can get that from me. I'm happy to answer that. Great. Thank, thank you all. Yes. Thank you, Baron. So uh, Rick asked about the recorded version. Uh, I have a YouTube site, which is, let me type it in, it's YouTube Force Connect. So I have to download the, the recorded version and then upload it to YouTube. That usually, I mean, it's available right away, but it just takes me some time to get to it. So I'll, I'll try to get this up within a couple of days. You can check it on YouTube, and you'll also be able to see it on the Force Connect webinar link uh, where I post the, the – it's just a link, a direct link to the Force Connect YouTube site. So thank you all very much. It's fine. I'm going to turn off my microphone and go to the lab. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>